the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now as the people were in expectation, and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and heavenly Father, we thank you for this wondrous, this miraculous gathering of your disciples in your name after 2015 years. We meet here around your word, the word made flesh that is your son. And we thank you for the gift of this meeting through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would bless us now, that you would help us now, not just to hear your word, not just to be hearers of it, but through your spirit, give us strength, Father, to hear your will, to know your will, and to do your will in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So those of you that have any kind of or have had any kind of full-time job, I expect you came to know it very well or you know it very well, and there's some jargon that you use that is associated with your job. Uh, for the visitors here that don't know, I am a full-time physical therapist when I am not a, a, a pastor, and we have our set of jargon. Uh, so if you're in your job and you know the lingo that you use, does it ever drive you buggy when someone else uses it differently? Really, does it? I mean, yes, because you know, we've been trained, we know what this stuff means, and it just, you know, just irks us just a little bit. You know, we try to be gracious about it. So, uh, as a therapist, if I could have a nickel for every time that I have heard the term rotator cup, C-U-P, you know it's cuff, right? C-U-F, like the round part of a cuff. That's what the rotator gets round and cuff-like. Yeah. Uh, so, and then some people add to it, um, they also call it the, the rotary cup. Uh, you know, and, and you know, I gotta have grace and you know, just you know, realize they have not had the medical termino terminology that I have. Um, as a pastor for the last year and a half, I have come to believe, I've come to know as I read scripture that there are some words that irk me. They just do. They bother. It's not so much that the words of Scripture irk me or bother me. It's where they are placed. It's like where a paragraph maybe begins. Did you notice that? In the, did it bother you, Pastor? Did, yeah, thank you. Oh, I am vindicated. Yes, it bothered him too. Okay, I'm just, did it bother anybody else? Then, 
on and on and on about John and repentance and this. That, you know, we can't see our buttons under here, but that pushes my pastoral buttons just a little bit. Um, then, and another translation from the Greek is, therefore. So the gospel reading for today is a result. Uh, then is called, the, it's, it's grammatical, I'll just throw it out there. It's a coordinating conjunction. There, I said it. There's the big 15 cent. There you go. It coordinates, it gets things together and connects things. So we got to go. So John's preaching about repentance, this, that, and the other. What are we going to do? What is repentance? That's the therefore. That's the then. That's what we need to know about today. The result is, uh, this is the result of verses 1 through 6. So repentance, uh, if I could go back and read it, uh, in Luke chapter 3, uh, the third verse, uh, uh, and he went out to all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of, meaning a baptism that belongs to, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Well, that's what's, what, what the whole connecting thing is. This is about repentance. And repentance, John links it to the preparation that he is the one that is preparing the way for the Lord and it has something to do with repentance. Does that word repentance sound familiar to anybody? I mean, what other season of the year? I know it's Advent. I know it's Advent. I love the blue. I love the expectation. I love that this is the joy Sunday. But can you make a connection with repent to any other season of the church here? Thank you, Lent. Yes, there is the, the coordinating. Yes, we can coordinate Advent with Lent. We are preparing for the coming of Jesus, for his coming to be the babe in the manger, uh, not just the, the, the feeding trough. He's the one that's going to be eaten up by our sin on the cross. So uh, John makes this connection of repentance with the preparations that we have. So just like in Lent, we're reflecting on something. We are reflecting inwardly on a reality. We are reflecting in Lent, just as in Advent, on the reality and the impact of sin in our lives. So the question is, what is repentance? If you had to give a one, if someone came up to you and said, hey, you know what, I've been reading this Bible, I haven't been in church in a while, or I've never been to church, what is this whole repentance thing about? What would you say? Are, are we, as, as uh, Paul would write to, uh, Tim, I believe it's Timothy or Titus, I can't remember which one, but be, always be prepared to make a defense of the gospel. What would you say? What would you tell that person that repentance is? Oh, it's actually, it's kind of related to, I think, a Trinitarian kind of thing. There's three things that go along with it. We have repentance, but there's, then there's that thing that we do, well, that we just did, that we do every service. The confession and forgiveness. They're all, confession, forgiveness, repent, they're all linked together. They are all gifts from God that come from his word. So if you had to just uh, give a, a two-word, two or three-word definition of repentance, it simply means in the Greek is a, a change of mind. You, you change your mind about, uh, about life and, and what the Word is saying to us. It's not just related to our mind, but it actually goes directly to our heart. So John, in our gospel lesson today, now that we're connected with what this all means, um, John the Baptist uh, kind of does two things. He, he does a wonderful, a blessed description of what repentance is not and what repentance is. He tells us what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. So I just wanted to focus on those two things today. So number one, what repentance does not look like? What it doesn't look like is what we do on our own. Repentance is not, a, look what I did, God. Repentance is actually, look what you did with a sinner like me. So, kind of like me, when someone mentions a rotator cup, John's just a little bit irked today, wouldn't you say? I'm not sure if he slept wrong that night, or maybe there's fleas in his camel hair, or his letter belt is chafing him somehow. He had just had a bad night or something. But John is just a little ticked off, I'm thinking. Uh, 
you know, people are coming to this baptism with um, expecting not to be changed. Expecting there to be it, just, just like a checklist that they can, uh, like they can claim their heritage to Abraham as a badge of salvation. Maybe, maybe the way that you know, we, you know, if we've served in the church for so long, we got that badge to show before God. Or if we've, you know, we have this family heritage, we've been Lutheran since we were born, you know, that gets us in. No, that is not what John is preaching about. He says, you know, that he, he actually calls those that he can see it in their heart or wants to make sure that they're coming for the right reason. Uh, I know it says brood of vipers, but you, a little bit more literally, you're the offspring. You're the children of a venomous. Now, you know, got to be theologically astute to figure out that this is not a good connotation, Right? That, that this snake, uh, the, the brood of vipers, a poisonous, venomous snake, is a reference to evil, right? It's all through the scriptures. Uh, it's right there. Um, John is um, you know, making that accusation. That to come to baptism, to remember your baptism, and it does not change us from the heart, actually leaves us in sin. That there is an expected change of heart, change of mind, knowing what God has done for us, yet still sinners. He sends his son, not when we were ready, but in his time, when he was ready. When we were yet dead in our sins. That's when Christ died for the ungodly. So uh, John is looking on this history of Israel as all of Israel is coming out to him. You know the history, right? Right? They love to make a good picture of worship. They love to make the best sacrifices, the best bulls, and then leave worship and continue in sin. That was the witness of Israel to that point. So our baptism into the death of Jesus, you are baptized into Christ and into his death. Um, we're, our baptism is about repentance as well. So as Jesus picks up the church from John. A, few, a, a little while later, uh, actually go back over to the Gospel of Mark in the first chapter, and in the 15th verse. So John was arrested. It says it right there, uh, Mark 14, uh, 1, 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the Gospel of God. And guess what he says? <laughs> the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent! And believe in the gospel. It's the same message. There is this repentance that is connected to our baptism. That change of mind and change of heart that God is calling his people to then, he is calling us to today. So it's not going to be connected to our name. It's not going to be uh, connected to Israel's position as God's chosen people. It's not going to be connected to our position in the church. It's not going to be connected to our checklist of things that we do for God. It's not going to be connected. We're not going to die and go to heaven. If you want to take your baptismal certificate and say, Hey, God, look what I got. I'm just saying, that's you know, not the point. It's going to be based on the word. And it's going to be based on faith. John connects this repentance to the fruit of a tree, doesn't he? I mean, he, he's, he's, he's making that distinct connection there. Now, just so that we understand the fruit, okay? The fruit is the end product, isn't it? What comes, what's the, what's the fruit attached to? You can answer. The branch. The branch is connected to... The trunk, the trunk is connected to, you know, the trunk bone is connected to the root bone, okay? And that root comes from something that was planted. It came from a seed. That seed of the word that we have here today in 2015, that fruit that we produce comes from faith in the word of God. So John connects repentance to actions, Actions that are born of faith. That confession that you and I did was a confession of faith. And the repentance that we have, that change of heart, that change of what we do in the world will be based on the word. Our confession and our repentance are our actions towards God 
in, in based on his word. And the forgiveness that comes from the confession and the repentance, that is God's action towards us based on his word. Based on the word that is Jesus, the word made flesh. And that forgiveness comes through God's love. That forgiveness from God comes through not a feeling, but an action. Love is an action. It is the action of Christ on the cross that I guarantee you did not feel good. That is the forgiveness. The action that God does towards us when we were yet sinners, he pays the price for ours. So as I reflect each morning on my sin, I mean, anybody got a longer list than I? I would really challenge you. Mine's pretty long. It takes you to this dark place. And there's no way God could forgive you for what you have done. And yet, at the end of that reflection, the reality of Christ and his resurrection, the reality of his presence as he comes from the tomb is still there. That grace is new and it's light and it's there every morning. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is God's forgiveness. So we have this, this gift, confession, repentance, for all gifts of God based on his word. So what repentance does not look like is a perfect life. What repentance looks like is a forgiven life. We are always going to be in bondage to sin. In, in spite of the forgiveness, we are going to go on being sinners, but what changes is the work of Christ. That's what changes our status before God is that gift of forgiveness from him. So that repentance is not a perfect life, but a forgiven life. So number one, that's what repentance doesn't look like. But John goes on and he's, um, he's pretty specific. Gives us some really good examples of what a repentant life does look like. So if you, I'm just thinking, if you've got some stuff laying around that is just sitting there. That is a blessing. It's a blessing to you waiting to be a blessing to others. You heard what uh, John said. If you got two tunics, it's the most basic form of clothing. It would be like if we were giving undergarments to, the, to the, uh, those in poverty, those that don't even have the basics. If you got more than enough basics, it can be, should be, a, a stewardship that we have of being a blessing to others. Not just made for our comfort and for our care, but to be distributed for the common good. That is our good. We're, we're reminded that this life is not our own. The stuff is not our own. We may have paid for it, but that was paid for by Christ on the cross. The stuff, all things that were made were made through him. You ever remember the last, can you remember the last, can you go back to last Christmas or, or just remember the last gift you got? Anybody thinking about their last breath? It's a gift. You're not controlling your own blood pressure. These are gifts that are given uh, through the one who made us and created us. And if we've got enough clothes, we can walk to be here. We can be here amidst the community. And we got some gifts. We have things, resources, time, talent, possessions that we can share. And, and it can just be a little thing. You know where my mind goes when I hear John talking about sharing two tunics and sharing food? Anybody go to Matthew 25? Does any, anybody remember Matthew 25? The sheep and the goats, he's separating them out. It's like the winnowing fork time. He's separating the sheep from the goats. And, and, and they're, they're asking, you know, well, you didn't feed the hungry. You didn't, you didn't clothe me. You didn't feed me. You didn't come to see me. Jesus, when didn't we do that? When you didn't do it, to the least of these, you did it not to me. The stuff, the very life, the very breath that we have are not ours. You and I were bought at a precious price. We belong not to ourselves, but to God. Blessed to be a blessing to others in so many ways. Time, talents, and possessions. We are called to share, the, share our lives with others because it's not ours. We are to use what we have been given. So I, I just want to point to a couple of abundant gifts that we have here. 
Um, some of us have abundant possessions and resources and finances, and, and we ask you to consider where that can be used. Seeing that it is not yours, it's not mine, it's not the church's, but belongs to God. Not for our comfort, but uh, for the common good. Some of us have abundant time. How many people retired here? You have, I'm just saying, abundant time. It is a gift from God. And, I, and God has given you gifts. I, I don't know how you want to use them. And we're not going to hold a sword over your head saying you have to do this or that or the other. But, but you got gifts. You got time that I don't have. I had two full-time jobs. I'm just saying there's some things I can't do, stuff for pastors that we're busy doing. Uh, we, we invite you. We know the joy. We know it all too well. And we want to share it with you. This joy, the, the joy comes from doing the will of God. Filling you up as a steward the way nothing else can. Uh, that time is a gift that you have. Not for our own comfort, but for the common good. Some of us have abundant talents. Not for the building up of the stuff in our lives, or not just to get to retirement, but for the common good. What gifts and talents do you have? And some of us have abundant health and the ability to do not to make a name for ourselves or to make our lives as easy as possible, but to serve Christ for the common good. That's what one part of repentance might look like. So, I mean, the crowd asks, and maybe you're asking the question yourselves, a very practical, if this is supposed to be related to some action, some change of heart, some change of mind, well then, what do we do, John? It's the same as when you know, Peter's preaching after the Holy Spirit comes, is preaching to people from all over the world, and they are cut to the heart. They know that their sin has killed Jesus, that your sin and my sin nailed him to the cross. What do we do, Peter? Well, if you would, if you pull out your pink insert. Uh, seriously, uh, pull it. What shall we do? Oh, I forgot to bring But I, I know what's on it. Uh, the caroling that we do. What shall we do? But why would we waste our time on shut-ins? Not mobile, not able to do for themselves. Why would we do that? Because it's what Christ did for us. Brought his presence this morning when we remembered our baptism. Brought his presence and his forgiveness into our lives so that we could share that with others that we could be stewards of that forgiveness. And that is just one way. Read the pink insert. There's any number of things to, to cook a meal for the mission house. To, you can cook it here and we'll send it out. You can, you can, and if you can do nothing else, you're asking, what can I do? I got a bad knee, I got a bad back, I need some therapy, but I can't get, I can't do all these things. I, you know, the, the, something happens to your hip, I don't know. Uh, whatever is going on, and you can't, you feel like you can't do. I give you this example. In my therapy clinic, on Thursday, at, Thursday morning, Betty comes to me, 80-something years old. The only place she gets to is therapy, because someone brings her. Can't drive, has had two neck surgeries, her back is shot, and I can just go down the list of the things that she can't do. And she is just looking at me, and just happens to know I'm a pastor. And he said, Brian, what is God, what is he doing? Why am I still here? I can't do anything. Well, actually, Betty, I, I, I have this bulletin over here, and it's got some ministries in it. And if you could, Betty, if you could pray for these ministries, that'd be really good. That'd be really good use of your time. And another thing about Betty is she's in more pain than you and I would like to believe. And do you know that she doesn't take pain medicine? Do you know why? It clouds her judgment when she's praying. She would rather joy in suffering she would rather endure the pain than to have her mind, a change of mind. She's changed her mind that she is going to focus on God and she will endure the pain so that she can be in communion with the living God. Yeah. 
you got things you can do. If nothing more than prayer. If nothing more than singing in tune, out of tune. I don't care. It's a gift just to be there. To do the ministry. To be stewards of our lives. What shall we do indeed? And I know I'm running out of time here, but I've got a whole list of other things. John points to the tax collectors that come, the enemies, the Israelites that work for the Romans. It's like he'll welcome them. He's not telling them not to do what they're called to do, but do it, uh, do it honestly. Because in that day and time, it's going to look different. The soldiers that come, now that's not just the, the home people working for the enemy, that's the enemies, the enemy themselves. There were Roman soldiers that came to John. Those that were unclean. Don't stop what you're doing, but do it honestly. Be a good steward of what you have been given. He welcomes even the enemies. Because those enemies, like Rahab, uh, she was a woman, she was uh, a prostitute, but yet changed her allegiance to the living God. And so when the winnowing fork goes up, you know that's how they separate the wheat from the chaff. They throw it in the air, the grain comes down, and the wind blows the chaff away. And the fruit is left. The faithful ones that know their place before God and know it's a dark place to be, but a forgiven place to be in Christ. So we have work to do. We have blessed work to do. We have repentance to do because of this word that has brought you and I here today, fallen sinners one and all, I pray that you would have blessing in that action. That prayer that is offered here and that is offered in the world for the ministries here and for those whom we will meet this week, they are blessed offerings, one and all, based in faith from the word of God, touching you and me today. I pray that blessing for us all, for you and for me, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.